Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is Mailbag. What is Mailbag? Well, I'm awfully glad that you asked. See, every day on the John Campia Show, Monday through Friday, we take the second half of the show to take the live comments and questions from the viewers watching live. But what if you're not watching the show live and you want to get a question or comment answered by myself or Rob or sometimes both of us? Well, that's why we have Mailbag. So if you want to send in a question or comment to be read here on Mailbag, all you have to do is go down into the description of this video and you'll see a tip link. Click on that there or enter it in manually at www.streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip. You'll begin your comment or question read on Mailbag if we deem your comment or question appropriate to be used on Mailbag. And of course, you'll be supporting the channel at the same time and all of us involved with the channel here Thank you guys so very much for your support. Okay, guys, let's not waste any time and get right into it, shall we? We're going to get things started off here with a question set in by Jay Bling, who writes, I don't know if this is true, but I read that Nicolas Cage initially turned down Face Off because he didn't want to play a villain. He ultimately signed on because he learned that the plot would actually have him play the hero for most of the movie. Uh, regardless, with him in mind, as a fellow advocate for the Hugh Jackman slash Ryan Reynolds face-off reboot, I have to ask you, who would you cast as whom in such a reboot before the face swapping? All right. Uh, first of all, the answer to that is I don't care. Like, I have been advocating for a long time of a Ryan Reynolds, Hugh Jackman reboot of face-off. I think that would be glorious, and I really don't care which one's playing Troy or what. It doesn't matter to me. And so just put both of them in there. That's all that matters. Swap them out. Don't mind. As far as the Nicolas Cage thing about not initially wanting to do it because he was the bad guy, I haven't heard that myself, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was true because that's not uncommon amongst a lot of Hollywood stars, right? They want to portray a certain image in Hollywood and maybe they don't want to play villains. So I, again, I'm not saying that's super common, but I'm saying it's not uncommon. So I haven't heard that that's true, but if it is, I wouldn't be surprised. And it's not diva-ish of him to do that. It's like I'm sure a lot of actors want to kind of steer their career a certain way. And if that was important to him at the time, then that was important to him. But one more time, I don't know that that is true. I'm just saying if it was true, it's not surprising. All right, thanks for writing that in, Jay Ling. Next up, Dr. Nova writes, Given how angry people at Pixar for uh, being mistreated and their open letter condemning Disney's hypocrisy in general, do you think there will be a mass exodus from Pixar? This is how DreamWorks was formed, more or less. Could that happen again? Yes, it could happen again. Now, I wouldn't put money on it happening again. I mean, Pixar is still Pixar, right? Like, you get a gig at Pixar, and you're in the world of storytelling and animation. I mean, that's kind of a dream, and things would have to be pretty bad for you to want to leave. But while I wouldn't put money on it happening, I wouldn't put money against it happening either. Like I, I myself received a message from an executive at Disney kind of expressing some real disillusionment with what's going on there. And, and they told me directly that there are creatives in the company. I don't think he mentioned Pixar specifically. But he said there are creatives in the country who are developing safety nets for themselves at other companies. And so, yeah, again, while I, I don't necessarily think a mass exodus is going to happen, don't think for a second that it's not possible because it is, especially with the way things are right now. All right, thanks for writing that in, Dr. Nova. Next up, Dr. Nova also writes, Why are people surprised that Twilight vampires sparkle? It's not that much of a leap given that ever since Dracula, vampires were seducing women. While while interview with the vampire, interview with the vampire uh, made them in made them inhumanly inhumanly beautiful in the 70s, vampires are sexy monsters. Um, I don't see how sparkling skin makes them sexy. I mean, I don't know about you, but if some woman came up to me at the bar and I looked up over at her and her skin was sparkling, I would think there's something wrong with her and that she should immediately go and see a dermatologist. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't see the sparkling thing has anything to do with the sexiness of vampires, like, at all. But I will say this. Obviously, the Twilight movies were not targeted at me. And while I actually didn't mind the, fi the final Twilight movie, I generally don't like the Twilight films. But I, I did actually kind of dig the last one. But still, I'm not the audience. I'm not a big fan of the series as a whole. But that being said, I have never had a problem 
with the whole idea of skin sparkling in daylight because I like it when movies take traditional mythologies and put their own little twist on it. And what if we said that, yeah, vampires can't go out in daylight, not because they burst into flames, but rather because if they go into daylight, they become exposed. And okay, what ex exposes them? Uh, maybe there's something in their skin that just f that that reflects light or whatever, and they, they appeal sparkly. So whatever it is, I actually don't hate that idea, to be honest with you. I know it gets made fun of a lot, but I don't have a problem with it. All right, next up, Bullet fifteen ten writes: Is the gray mist that rolls over Kamar Taj in the Doctor Strange: The Multiverse of Madness trailer actually Alioth from the Loki show? One hundred percent, no chance. And he's escaped and hunting for food through the multiverse. Zero chance. Number one, how does that fit in at all with anything we know about this story? Not remotely in the least is it at any way connected. So there's that. The other thing was it would break Kevin Feige's rule because if that were the case, you would have to have watched the Loki series in order to understand that main fundamental thing going on in Multiverse of Madness. And the way Kevin Feige conducts all the Marvel properties is he makes sure every single Marvel property is an entry point for anybody. Like, no potential new audience members for an MCU thing has to say, do I have to go back and watch those six things? Nope. Any Marvel movie is a very accessible entry point for anybody to jump on board. And that's one of the big reasons why the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the MCU, has become the most dominant force in entertainment. Because as they were building and developing, they made sure that every single movie was a very easily accessible entry point for any potential new fans. And then they go, go back later. So... No, for that reason and many others, Bull, I, I don't see that being the case here at all. All right, Big Will writes, Hey, John and crew, have you guys seen Bel Air on Peacock yet? I'm in love with this show. It took a major big risk tapping into a 90s classic, but turning this into a serious drama is paying off big time. Thanks and bring on the filthy. Okay, so I have watched a couple of episodes. Anne's really quite into the show. My wife, Anne, really quite likes it. And I've watched a couple of episodes. Um, and I, I've liked what I've seen. The interesting thing about Bel Air or the Fresh Prince of Bel Air is that when you really sit down, and I've mentioned this before, when you really sit down and look at the story of it, it's a drama. It's not a comedy. Like if you go back and you look at the basic underlying story of Will Smith's Fresh Prince of Bel Air, a young man growing up in a tough set of circumstances in an area where his mother starts to fear for his very safety, just living in that context. And the mother decides for her son's future, safety and future, she needs to send him to other family in a different part of the, of the country that where she believes he will have a better shot at life. And then when he arrives there, there's a culture shock because he's gone from the, the, the socio-realities of living in the area of Philadelphia where he lived to living in Bel Air in wealth and prosperity. And the culture shock and the fish out of water story that comes along with that when you just look at that basic story you that's a that's a drama right that's pure drama but fresh prince of beller made it a comedy so i'm not really surprised they just, they took this approach with it here and and yeah to from what i've seen so far it's working pretty well so far all right next up bill big will also writes hey john with uh so my favorite star wars character is galen merrick slash star killer I love his backstory and him being a secret apprentice. How would you bring into the Disney canon? Also, do you think this character is worth bringing into live action? Bring on the filthy. All right, so Starkiller, who is, of course, modeled after and voice acted by Sam Witwer. Fabulous, wonderful actor. Killer Star Wars trivia guy who I have beaten twice. I'm just throwing that out there that I've beaten Sam Witwer in Star Wars trivia both times that I've faced him. But, you know, he neither here nor The dude's a beast. The dude's an absolute beast, and he's tremendously talented, and I love watching him on stuff. And by the way, he's a psychotically really nice guy. Like, psychotically nice. Couldn't be nicer. Um, and I've always enjoyed whatever whenever I've had the opportunity. I first met him on the set of the... Uh, the G Gerard Butler film Gamer that also had Milo Ventimiglia 
It was directed by Mark Neville Dean and Brian Taylor, who are a couple of friends of mine who are responsible for me meeting my wife. Mark Neville Dean and Brian Taylor, who also did Crank and Crank 2, they did Gamer. Uh, they're the ones who are responsible, them and Milo, for me meeting my wife, Anne. But anyway, it was on set of that movie in New Mexico that I first met Sam Witwer. And I, I, I laughed so freaking hard because he started doing this Emperor Palpatine imitation that just was killing me. Super nice guy. Anyway. Could you bring him in? Well, here's the thing. The video game story of Starkiller is not canon, and you can't bring it into canon. However, look at a character like Grand Admiral Thrawn, right? Look at Thrawn. They didn't bring the heir to the Empire story into modern Star Wars canon, but still they saw that character, and Cherry picked him out, made some adjustments to him, changed what the background story is, like got rid of that canon, and then dropped him into Rebels. And now we're going to see him in the Ahsoka thing, right? So that was an example that they went in, took a character, plucked him from that non-canon material, and changed it around just a little bit and dropped that character in canon material. You can easily do that here with Galen. You could do that with Galen easily. Yeah, it'd be, it would be a different story, but you can keep the essence of the character. And so, and if you do it, you got to bring Sam Witwer in. It's got to be Sam Witwer doing it. At least that's kind of my take on it. All right, next up, we've got Xander uh, Paoli, who writes, Last year, I sent myself on a journey to watch every theatrically released Marvel movie. A guilty pleasure of mine is, every now and then, watching George Lucas's Howard the Duck. It's laughably terrible. What are your thoughts on this awful film? Exactly what you just said. It's laughably terrible, and it's an awful film. Now, look, there are definitely those movies out there that are so bad, they're awesome to watch. Like, for me, it's Vanilla Ice is Cool as Ice. I can watch that movie once every six months for the rest of my life and always laugh my ass off. Tremendously entertaining. Howard the Duck is not that. Howard the Duck is just plain awful to me. <laughs> so, hey, if it's a guilty pleasure of yours, man, that's awesome. All right, next up, Abdul writes, Hey, guys, I personally love the Batman very much. Me too. I love how the movie was never afraid to showcase how damaged Bruce really is and the idea of no duality at this point. Incredible way to start the character arc, in my opinion. See, I, I disagree. Like, I love the Batman. I love this movie. The one weakness is, though, that there is no duality, right? When Bruce Wayne is out in public, he's the exact same guy as the Batman is when he's wearing his cowl. He's the same dark, brooding, antisocial, whatever, right? And like to me, at the very beginning of his career as the Batman, he would have known, I've got to create this fake artificial personality. I got to create this fake Bruce Wayne character because he's really the Batman. That's who he is. But he's got to create this fake Bruce Wayne character that's got to be fundamentally different than, than who I really am. And that's one of the reasons why I love Ben Affleck's Batman so much. I prefer Robert Pattinson's Batman movie over Ben Affleck's Batman movies. But I think I still kind of prefer Ben Affleck a little bit just because they got that duality, right? And again, when he's already in year two of being Batman... This is something he should have figured out before he even started day one. So while I absolutely adore this movie completely, I would say that's one little thing, that's a nitpick of mine, that I wish they had kind of developed out that duality just a little bit more. But that's just me. All right. Shekel Money writes, Hey, John, love the show and also Movie Club. Thank you so much, my friend. Have you thought about uh, maybe doing a similar show uh, but about movies that you think are less well-known and people should see. Foreign films, old films, or festival films, thank you. All right, thanks a lot for saying that in, Shekel Money. The short answer to that is no. And the reason the answer is no is because it would nobody would watch it. They would be the smallest viewed videos on our channel. And when you understand how many hours goes into making these videos, you've got to have some kind of, there's got to be a bang for your buck return on it, right? That our, that it's our audience loves it, the audience engages with it, they watch the videos and all that kind of stuff. Because if they don't, then it's just a waste of our time, right? And I've done this before, as a matter of fact. It's called, I think it's called, 
It was called AMC Independent. You know, Hulse, give me one second. Let me just look up the name of it again. Yeah, okay. So the AMC Theaters program was called AMC Independent. So I created a show called AMC I Ind Indie Spotlight. Okay, it was called AMC Indie Spotlight is what we called it. Where it was a show completely dedicated to independent film, to smaller independent film. And I'll tell you right now, the show was great. It was great. And we had two hosts on it who were incredible. Um, AMC OG, uh, Amy Rose Eisenbach, and um, why am I, uh, I, I almost said the name of her, uh, her, her friend, Alicia Malone. So AMC, I almost said Maude Garrett, who was like Alicia's best friend. Um, so we had Maude Garrett, I said Maude Garrett again. We had Alicia Malone and Amy Rose Eisenbach, and they were fabulous. Like absolutely fabulous hosts of this show. And the show was wonderful. They, they ran it beautifully and it was a great show. I watched it like I would watch it every single time without fail. I found it informative and interesting. They just, it was such a great show. If you were interested in that, those types of films, here's the problem. Despite how fantastic they made that show and they did, they made it fantastic. And despite how gifted and talented those two hosts were, and they were, they were incredibly gifted and talented. The reality was is that AMC Indie Spotlight was our lowest viewed show. Like, out of everything we made, it was by far, by far, the lowest viewed show we had. And we, we knew that going in, that, that that was a show that was going to appeal to a more limited audience. We knew that, but it was, it was quite a lot. Now, AMC Independent, the program at AMC Theaters, they would fund us. I mean, they, they so we, we kept it going, but... It was by far the, the least viewed thing we did. And I can guarantee you, now while on the John Campia show, like every day, like, yeah, we, still, we have stories about Batman and Doctor Strange, but every day we also have stories about smaller films and things like that too. So we'll do those stories. But if we were to do a show that was dedicated to those smaller movies, those festival films, those international films, and obviously there's exceptions to that too, like Drive My Car, uh, Parasite, you know, things like that. But if we were to do that, here's the reality. They would by far be the lowest viewed things we have on the channel. And we wouldn't be able to justify the amount of work and effort and man hours and resources we would have to put into making that show any good to get an extremely small number of, of views to it. And that's the lifeblood of the channel is, is viewership, right? So while we, we will continue to cover films like that, you know, when they become newsworthy uh, on the shows like the John Campus show, we probably won't be making any show that is dedicated to that. So there, I just gave you a little bit of a behind the curtain look about some of the thought process and rationale that goes into making those types of decisions. But no, unfortunately, we, we won't be doing a show like that unless like some indie studio or whatever wants to come along and sponsor such a show. No, then, then we could be cooking. I would love to do that show, but otherwise I don't think we can. Anyway, great question. Shuckle monkey. Thanks for writing that in or shuckle money. I should say next up Dominic Tan writes, Hey John, your recent discussion on the various Pinocchio projects, which are currently underway, got me thinking about a previous times when multiple movies came out at around the same time that dealt with similar subjects. For example, Deep Impact and Armageddon, uh, The Prestige and The Illusionist, A Bug's Life and Ants, Friends with Benefits, and I forgot about those ones, Friends with Benefits and No Strings Attached. My question is, are these all coincidences or... Is there something else going on behind the scenes? Love the show all the way from Singapore. Well, thank you for writing it from Singapore, my friend. And yeah, don't forget about other... We just talked this morning about Dante's Peak and Volcano. Or or uh, Olympus Has Fallen and White House Down, right? Uh, two, on the surface, identical movies that come out right about the same time. I'll tell you this. The majority of the time, it's not a coincidence. You know, something's either hot in the pop culture or an idea is floated out there and it sounds like a great one and multiple studios want to do it and whatever. So they find ways to do it. Now, I'm sure sometimes it is a coincidence, but I really think for the most part, it's not a coincidence. You know, oh, the idea about, you know, terrorists taking over the White House. 
that idea gets floated and circulated around Hollywood and one says, well, wait a minute, somebody submitted a script for like that to us a while ago and it's totally different from that other script. Well, let's do ours too, right? So yeah, I, I think for the most part, it's probably not a coincidence, Dominic. Good question. All right, next up. Mischievous Gremlin writes, one of four. Hey, John and crew. How are you guys doing with your day slash week? Mine's going great, thank you. Uh, with Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, now just two months away, which is so exciting. I was just looking at the movies coming out in April, and damn, that is going to be a packed month. Yes, it is. You start with Morbius. I got my tickets to Morbius today, by the way. You start with Morbius. If he doesn't move again, yeah, that's a big question. Then the next week, you both have Ambulance and Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Then the week after that, you have Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore. And just when you think that's not enough, the next week you have The Bad Guys, The Northsman, which is my second most anticipated film of the year, by the way. Um, the Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. Uh, that's one packed month. And I didn't even mention the other movies I look forward to at the time, Everything Everywhere All at Once and Hatchling. And by the way, I also have my tickets already for Everything Everywhere All at Once. Okay. Uh, oh, there's one more part. Uh, so that's like, what, nine or ten movies? I also think Father Stew comes out that month as well. Are you looking forward to any or all of these movies? And what are your thoughts on April possibility being the most packed month since the pandemic? Well, first of all, let's start with that. It absolutely is the most packed month since the pandemic. I mean, no doubt. It, it's really going to be, I think April is going to be the first month where as a moviegoer, it's going to feel like things getting back to normal. I mean, it's been good. We've, we've been having a steady supply of movies coming out to theaters, but we have not yet had a month where we've been back into like what feels like a regular flow. Like one to two brand new wide, wide releases every single week. I really haven't felt like we've had a month that's really got that yet. And April is absolutely going to be that and i am so excited for it especially because there's a couple of movies that i'm just not just enthusiastic about but i'm dying to see one of which is morbius now i know a lot of people are skeptical about whether or not that movie is going to be good i'm going into it with the belief that it's going to be awesome whether it is or not i don't know we'll find out but i'm going into it with the belief that this is going to be awesome i love the trailers and what we've seen so far and that's been great um, then Sonic, I'm getting quite interested in Sonic. I got to admit, I'm not super interested in Ambulance. I saw a good lengthy preview for it at CinemaCon, and I know a lot of people are very excited for it, and I love Jake Gyllenhaal, but I don't know. It's, it's not, it's not clicking for me. Hopefully it'll be really good. I'm very interested in the new Fantastic Beasts movie. And like I said, The Northman is my number two most anticipated film of the year. The Unbearable Weight of Being with Nicolas Cage that could be either really great or really, truly awful. We're going to have to wait and see. And everything, everywhere, all at once. So, yeah, I, I'm. there's much I'm looking forward to in April, um, just all together. And it's going to be great, uh, Mischievous Gremlin, to kind of get back to that sense of normalcy again. As a moviegoer, it's been over two years. And I'm looking forward to getting back in there and going to the theater more regularly again to going to see these new movies. I'm very excited for it, and I'm glad you wrote that in. Thanks for writing that in, man. Guys, we want to take a moment and thank the sponsor of this video, Athletic Greens. Now, I started taking Athletic Greens because I don't eat enough vegetables, and I was looking for a way to make up for that deficit in my diet of those vitamins and minerals that I really need in my system, and thank goodness I found Athletic Greens, and I literally take it every morning. You see, with one scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole foods, source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, all the things. And my wife got onto it, and now she absolutely loves it. You know, tons of people take some kind of multivitamin, and it's important to choose one with high-quality ingredients that your body will absolutely actually absorb like athletic greens. So right now it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with a convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into the flu and cold season. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and 
five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash campia. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash campia to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, next up, we've got a new, newly Kim's Convenience fan. I love the name. Uh, writes, hey, John, I finished the show for the first time. I'm assuming you're talking about Kim's Convenience. And you were right. It's amazing comedy. Uh, thank you for the recommendation. Also, didn't realize that Paul Sun Hyung Lee had a YouTube channel. Uh, turns out that he's just a big sweaty. I knew he was in Star Wars, but yeah. Um, seems like a really cool person, really down to earth. I sure hope Disney uses more of him, and I can't wait to see him in Avatar in the Avatar show. Of course, he's playing Uncle Iroh in the upcoming Avatar The Last Airbender uh, show. Mr. Kim is top comedy character for me now. Thanks again for recommending Kim's Convenience. Thanks. Bring on the filthy. And okay, see you. Yeah, listen, guys, I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, I have talked for a while about Kim's Convenience and how... Um, now, I, I was a little bit late to the party. I only discovered it when it was already like in its third or fourth season. But I, Ann and I both quickly binged the whole damn thing. It's so good. It's so good. It's funny and endearing and heartfelt and warm and hilarious. And Mr. Kim is seriously one of the great, I think a top three best character in sitcoms ever. Like I put him up there with Ron Swanson and, and you know, uh, Michael Scott. I think Mr. Kim is like right up there. I, I really, really do. And, you know, and by the way, it's not only does he come from Kim's Convenience, but also, you know, Shang-Chi, Simu Lu, who plays Mr. Kim's son in that. He was a series regular, uh, like a like a full-time regular cast member on that show, and he was fantastic in it. So if you have not yet checked out Kim's Convenience, I highly recommend that you get on that and do that. I'm glad you are too, man. All right, next up, Nate Dog writes, I saw the Batman in a locally owned theater and they gave us a five minute break halfway through the movie. I was able to use the bathroom and refill my soda. I'm now a believer in intermission. It didn't take away from the film and was a welcome break. All right. Well, first of all, Nate dog, that is awesome that they did that for you. That was fantastic that they did that to you. And, and it does bring up the point for you guys who watch the show regularly. You know, I am and have been an advocate for the idea of returning the intermission for not all movies, but for movies that are exceptionally long, like say two minutes and 45 or two hours and 45 minutes or longer, or two minutes, two minutes, two hours and 50 minutes or longer, you know, something like that. The idea of having like a five, six, seven minute break in between, you know, around the halfway part of the movie, like find a good spot in the movie to, to create that break and have a short break. Now, Whenever this topic comes up, and I'll talk about all the benefits of doing that in a second, but whenever the topic of that comes up, I inevitably hear some of my dear friends too, but I inevitably hear some of my brothers and sisters in film fandom complain, but if you take a break, it takes me out of the movie. I, I, I just, I am taken out of the film and, and then, oh, now I can't watch the movie anymore. To which I proclaim bull. Bull. You watch movies and stuff at home. You are constantly hitting pause, running to grab a bite from the fridge or a drink from the fridge, run into the bathroom, taking a call, sending a text message, whatever, and then you come back to your couch and you hit play and you're right back into it again. This whole concept that the human mind is completely incapable of stopping watching something for a moment and then picking it up again a few moments later. That's like saying, I can't watch episodes of TV because when one episode ends, that takes me out of the story. I can't be expected to come back and watch again next week. I've already been taken out of the story. No, 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 no. As a human being, your brain works and you can walk away from it and come back to it, sit back down and pick back up. That's what you can do. So I call complete BS on that, on that excuse. Now, if you're just somebody that doesn't like the idea of uh, intermission, that's perfectly fine. That's, uh, nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that BS excuse about, oh, our, our human brains are not biologically evolved enough to be able to stop. No, 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 bull. 
But I do want to suggest that there are a couple of really good advantages to the idea of an intermission. Uh, advantage number one, look, we go to these movies and we buy, I don't know about you, I buy these big honking things of soda. I just like drinking soda when I'm watching a movie. Maybe I shouldn't, but I do, and I think a lot of other people do as well. And even if you're one of these people that you can make it through an entire three-hour movie without having to go to the bathroom, that's great. I bet for a lot of you, though, in the last 20 minutes... You're probably like squirming in your seat a bit and you're like a lot of your mental energy is being dedicated to don't pee yourself, don't pee, don't pee, don't piss your pants, man, not here in the theater. And then when the movie ends and you get up and run to the bathroom as fast as you can, I would suggest that's far more of a distraction from the movie. But here's the thing. If you make the choice to go to the bathroom, that means you have to make a choice to miss some of the movie, Right. Or if you're hungry and you really want to have, uh, like, you want to refill your soda or refill your popcorn or something like that, you have to make the choice to either, will go without that luxury or having to sacrifice missing some of the movie. Whereas if you had a scheduled intermission, that was just a couple of minutes long, you would know that, ah, I can run to the bathroom now. I, I can hold it for a bit more because I know there's an intermission coming. It's like, oh, I got to the bottom of my popcorn bag, and but I want more. That's okay. Just just wait another 10 minutes. There's going to be an intermission. I can run and grab some more. Or somebody feels their phone going off in their pocket. <laughs> Pardon me. They feel their phone, but they get, they're getting text messages or whatever. And it's like, okay, I don't have to pull my phone out here in the theater, which you should never do. Don't be one of those assholes, by the way. Do not be one of those people that pulls your phone out in the theater, please. But... Instead of going, you, say, you know what, it's all right. I don't have to pull my phone out because I know in about 15 minutes there's going to be an intermission. I can step out, pull up my phone, check my messages, make sure there's nothing bad going on, all that kind of stuff. And here's the other thing, too. It's an advantage, not just for the people who want to go to the bathroom or go get more food or go check their phones. It's an advantage for people still sitting in the theater. Because I would much rather there be a short break where people can get up and walk by me than when I'm trying to watch the movie and you know there's no space between your knees and the chair in front of you, but somebody's got to come by and goes, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And sometimes that's me. I hate being that guy. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And you're walking in front of them and cutting off their view and disturbing them. And that happens like three or four times during a movie, right? If I knew it would be so great if there was an intermission. So those people, excuse me, Excuse me, they can do that during the intermission and it makes my view, when I am watching the movie and the movie's on, the most uninterrupted, best viewing thing possible. Again, I would not do it for every movie, but movies that are like 245, 250, 255 or longer, I think those are good. Now, listen, there is one problem, though, with the idea of an intermission, a, a legitimate problem, and that is this. You were already talking about an exceptionally long movie. Like when you get into the 245s, three hours, whatever, we're already talking about an exceptionally long movie. You add on top of that, the irrational number of commercials and trailers that play before a movie, adding 25 to 30 minutes to the overall showtime. You were already talking about an exceptionally long experience. And while five, six, seven minutes of an intermission doesn't sound long, when you're adding it on top of an already exceptionally long movie, that becomes a factor. I, I mean, even I, a big advocate for the idea of intermissions, even I have to acknowledge that's probably a big, a big factor, right? So, uh, but is it a, a, a problem that can be navigated? Is the situation where the benefits outweigh the drawback? And I would leave that to everybody else to decide. But listen, Nate Dog, I love that you have a theater that did that for you because I'm a strong advocate for for intermissions in movies and i'm glad they gave you one man i'd love to see it come nationwide all right that's just me though all right next up uh we've got uh oloro timmy i hope i'm saying your name right brother right hey john spider-man no way home is closing in on 800 million domestic and 1.9 billion worldwide you mentioned that making $2 billion was not possible yeah i said $2 billion was off the table uh, especially given no release in china how much are you impressed by the box office numbers as the movie is finishing its run? Short answer, tremendously. Absolutely tremendously impressed. Now, I, you're right. I did say before that $2 billion is not on the table. And I was right. It's not going to hit $2 billion. But damn, it's going to come a lot closer than I thought it would. I think it's going to come a lot closer than 
more than Tom Holland in his wildest wet dreams could have possibly. I mean, this thing far exceeded everybody's expectations. Especially impressive is when you consider this happening in a pandemic recovery era. Like, it's not just even, look, even take the pandemic out of it. What Spider-Man No Way Home has done at the box office is nothing short of remarkable. One of the biggest films in the history of cinema. And you add on top of that the fact that it happened during a pandemic era. In the midst of pandemic recovery, it, it I mean, that just makes it all the more impressive. So how impressed am I, dude? Extremely impressed. Anyway, thanks for writing that in, man. All right, next up. Uh, Jesse has a turtle rights. Hey, John, huge fan. Thank you so much, Jesse. Curious if you or anyone else has been noticing the lack of actors keeping the mask keeping on the mask in superhero films, the Batman and Deadpool excluded. I understand it's for the actor to show emotion easier, but I still wish it was less frequent. I'll be honest with you, Jesse, I don't know what you're talking about. What, what superheroes are constantly taking off their masks that normally wear masks? Like Spider-Man, when he's out in public doing Spider-Man-y things, he has the mask on. Uh, Thor doesn't wear a mask in general, so there's that. Black Widow doesn't wear a mask. Uh, I haven't seen Flash take off his mask when he's around other people. I mean, other than people already know he, he's Barry, but that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, Wonder Woman doesn't wear a mask. Aquaman doesn't wear a mask. Yeah, I, I you know what? Do me a favor, Jesse. Can you email me? At john at the john show.com. That's john, J O H N, at the john show.com. Email me and tell me who you're thinking about. Because honestly, I, I can't, I can't think of any off the top of my head, let alone it being a big, huge problem. But maybe I'm missing some things. Can you email me and let me know? That would be great. All right. Next up, we got Tyler C who writes. Hey, John and crew. First time writing in. Well, thank you for writing in, man. I appreciate that, Tyler. I love the show and everything you guys do. Thank you so much. The Boys Season 3 trailer dropped, and oh my God, does it look good. Butcher with laser eyes, Homelander milking a cow. That was hilarious. Uh, this trailer was awesome. What are your thoughts? All right, Tyler, thanks a lot for writing that in. And look, you guys know I am a big, big The Boys fan. I have loved this show from episode one. Uh, I thought the second season was great. And I am especially excited, since I'm also a very, very big Supernatural fan, that Jensen Ackles is coming in as Soldier Boy. That, to me, is very exciting. The, the Captain America wannabe character. I think that is going to be great. So seeing this trailer drop with uh, everything that they have in it and that's all the gore is there all the wacky violence but also seeing little glimpses of soldier boy and again homelander milking a cow it's like come on and the idea of billy butcher legitimately having a fight with homelander has me ridiculously excited so yes tyler I am absolutely ludicrously excited for The Boys Season 3. I can't wait to watch it, and I also thought the trailer was awesome. All right, next up. We've got Stephen Stranger Things. I like the name he writes. Hey, JC and crew. I'm loving the new Bel Air drama. You're like the second person to write that in so far. Uh, adaptation of Fresh Prince of Bel Air. What is a sitcom that you'd love to see? They already have my all-time favorite, but Family Matters, which SNL made a sketch on, would be second. Love the show. So... Uh, are you asking what would be another like sitcom kind of comedy that they could redo as a drama? Oh, that's a good question. Um, hmm. Frasier. Frasier comes to mind. I, I mean, I think about it. Frasier. What's the basic underlying idea of Frasier? A, a therapist, a psychiatrist, after suffering a personal loss... Of course, because remember in Cheers, I think he was engaged to Diane and then you know, that broke off and broke start. So a psychologist seeking to heal of his own personal hurts moves back home to Seattle where he has semi broken, not completely broken, but, but strained relationships with his father and his brother. 
And he moves back home to try to rebuild himself, reconnect with his family, and to kind of move on with his life. That, kind of like Bel Air, sounds like a drama. So, yeah, off the top of my head, I'm going to say Frasier could be one of their shows. Maybe yes, maybe no. That's where I'm going to go with for now. Thanks, Stephen. All right, Film Boss writes, Just to give a shout-out to an often overlooked director, Rob Reiner, who is awesome, Uh, had an eight-year reign from 1984 to 1992 where he had this string of films, Spinal Tap, Stand By Me, Princess Bride, When Harry Met Sally, Misery, A Few Good Men, Classic Still Today. And yeah, listen, he is Hollywood royalty because, of course, his father was Carl Reiner, who is an icon and a legend himself that we just recently lost. He he passed away not too long ago. Uh, And he was absolutely wonderful. But yes, Rob Reiner, who... For, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he was Meathead in All in the Family. Was I think he was. I could be wrong about that, but I was pretty sure he was Meathead in All in the Family. But also, by the way, he was a recurring character on New Girl. and Because I believe he was a recurring character. He was Jess's dad, I believe. And he was great in that as well. But yeah, when you look down these films, like these are kind of like films that defined an era. And by the way, Princess Bride... I think it's like one of the most beloved movies like ever made. I'm not saying it's a, it's a top 10 greatest film ever made, but I don't think it's a big stretch to say it might be one of the most beloved because everybody loves princess bride. Like, unless you don't have a pulse, all film is subjective. I'm not, obviously you may not like, and if you don't, that's perfectly fine. But I'm just saying I have never in my life met a person that didn't like princess bride. When Harry Met Sally, absolute class. I mean, a a lot of these ones you meant, Spinal Tap, but this one goes to 11. Spinal Tap, fabulous. You're right. Um, He's a guy now, 10 years ago, he still got credit, but you don't hear him talked about a lot today, and he totally should. He's a pioneering director. He made some of the great films, and I'm glad you brought him up, Film Film Boss. Thanks for doing that. All right, next up, Mike G writes, Hey guys, love the show. Thank you so much, Mike G. Thanks for being so chill and friendly. Saw La Batman again. I see what you did there. Uh, A second time. Liked it much more. Dark tone slash grounded elements aren't to hide the cartoony source material, but to make a more beautiful movie gave me Batman Returns vibes piece. You know what? I'm actually going to disagree with you. If anything, I thought Batman Returns, Tim Burton's second Batman movie, uh, that really did have a lot of cartoony overtones to it. I, I will admit, I'm not a giant fan of Batman Returns. Now, great, it had some great things in it. Danny DeVito's Penguin, Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman. Absolutely. But, yeah, man, I'm not the... I got to admit, I'm not the biggest fan of the film. It was a little bit too outlandishly cartoony for me. Uh, but that's just me and my taste. Like, I'm not, I'm not trashing on anybody else who likes it, because I'm sure a lot of people really do. But for me, not much. The Batman was different. The Batman felt to me like... If this was actually happening somewhere in the world, that's exactly what it would look like. You know what I mean? That's kind of how my thought on it is, Mike G. But I absolutely love the film. I'm glad you enjoyed it too, man. All right. Next up. Chuck the Mystery writes, Hey, John slash Rob, just me today. I was re-watching some classics this weekend, including The Conversation and The Verdict. Oh, The Verdict is one of my favorites. Uh, The Verdict is my favorite Paul Newman performance. I don't know if I'd say it's my favorite Paul Newman performance, but I absolutely love that movie. Uh, And the fact that The Conversation was released the same year as Godfather 2 makes me appreciate um, uh, Coppola even more. A lot of people forget today that around that time, Francis Ford Coppola, like, was a very big deal. I mean, to a degree, he still is. But let's go back to what you're talking about there for a second with The Verdict. The Verdict is, like, it it came out in an era when, like, courtroom thrillers were, like, all the rage. That and, like, investigation movies were all the rage. It feels like today most courtroom drama and investigation stuff has been relegated to television, but there was an era there right in there when like courtroom drama was like and courtroom thrillers was like a big, big, big thing. And in the midst of that, you had the verdict with Paul Newman and Charlotte Rampling, who, of course, is now the Jesuit mother in Dune. Uh, that's what at least that's the most recent thing I saw her in. And she's great in that. And 
I absolutely adored that. Kudos to you, Chuck the Mystery, for bringing that one up. All right. Next up, Chuck the Mystery also writes, also rewatched my favorite Denzel performance in Carl Franklin's Devil in a Blue Dress. Remember I was just saying courtroom thrillers and investigation movies? Here's the other one, the investigation side. What a film. Jennifer Beals and Don Cheadle were fantastic in it as well. I think that movie is almost as underrated as Changing Lanes. Not enough people have seen these. Now, I, I really like Devil in a Blue Dress. I I don't know that I'd call it one of the most underrated. By the way, you Jennifer Beals, who we just saw in uh, Book of Boba Fett, uh, Don Cheadle, who of course is War Machine, but he's fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Hotel Rwanda and things. He's a fabulous, incredible, Oscar caliber kind of actor. By the way, Tom Sizemore was really good in that too. Tom Sizemore was really, really good in that. So I, again, kind of fills in, this was an era when courtroom thrillers and investigation kind of movies were kind of king. And uh, those rank right up there. Again, I don't think one of the most underrated ever, but uh, definitely a solid, solid film. And good again, kudos to you, Chuck, for bringing that one up. All right, Chuck also writes, we've talked about whether Batgirl could go theatrical, and now the discussion has become, will they have to delay it due to the flash delay? So, as of today, what are your thoughts? Will Batgirl be delayed, and will it go theatrical over under 30% on each? Well, those are two separate questions. And... Let's let's set the context for all this, right? Okay, so on the theatrical versus home video side, the context is HBO Max announced that they were doing a Batgirl movie and it would be a straight to HBO Max film, right? That was announced a long time ago. The reason it's come into question a little bit is because around the same time, a Blue Beetle movie was announced that would be going straight to HBO Max. But recently... They made the announcement that they changed their minds and Blue Beetle was actually going to go full theatrical, which got a lot of people like myself very excited. So the question hovering around out there is, could Batgirl get that move too? In the question of over or under 30% that Batgirl goes theatrical, I'm not going to say it's like 80 or 90% that goes theatrical, but I'll go over 30 Actually, to be honest with you, I think right now it's a coin toss. Remember, Discovery is about to take over Warner Brothers. And when they do, I would not be surprised at all if they said, oh, yeah, that back row movie you're making right now, that we're making right now, yeah, 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 yeah. We're, we're putting that into theaters first. We're going to make some millions of dollars on it in theaters first, and then we'll put it on HBO Max or whatever their streaming service is going to be called after the merger. So not 80 or 90%, but over 30. I'll definitely take the over on that as to whether or not Batgirl is going to go theatrical or stay in HBO Max. I'll go over 30% that it goes theatrical. Now, on the question about whether it moves dates, this is where it gets really interesting. So let's set the context for this. Batgirl has, up until last week, was supposed to come out after the new Flash movie. And why that's important is because Batgirl is going to have Michael Keaton's Batman in it, a Michael Keaton Batman that is getting introduced in The Flash. So the way it's supposed to be is The Flash comes out first, introduces Michael Keaton's Batman, and then a little bit later, Batgirl comes out on HBO, and Michael Keaton's Batman is going to be in that movie as well. Well, that was all fine and good until last week when Warner Brothers announced a massive shift where a bunch of their movies including The Flash, that got moved another six months back again from 2022 all the way into 2023. And this raises an interesting question. Well, since Michael Keaton Batman is being introduced there and he's going to be in Batgirl, and now Flash is opening over here, doesn't Batgirl have to move as well? The traditional wisdom would say, yes, Batgirl's going to move. Because Flash apparently needs to come out first. However, why would Warner Brothers not announce if they were going to move Batgirl, why wouldn't they announce moving it at the same time they were announcing all these other movies moving? Like if you're going to put out one big announcement that all these movies are moving, Black Adam's moving, uh, the Flash is moving, so on and so forth, right? If, if you're going to be moving all these movies and Aquaman got pushed back, if you're going to do that, 
and you're moving back, girl, why wouldn't you announce it at the same time? It doesn't make any sense. So, while I, it is totally conceivable that Batgirl also gets moved, the argument of then why wouldn't they have announced it when they announced the Flash's move really weighs heavy. So I'm going to say under 30% that Batgirl moves release dates. Uh, again, I'm not saying 0%. I'm not saying 1% or 2%, but 30% is pretty high. So I'm going to actually take under 30 So I'll take over 30% that Batgirl goes theatrical. I will go under 30% that it moves. Both scenarios are totally feasible, but that's where I'm going to sit on that for right now. Thanks for writing that in, Chuck. All right, next up, we've got, where are we at here? We are at Dr. B, or Dre B, who writes, I am a huge Avatar The Last Airbender fan. With Paramount doing Avatar Studios, I always thought it'd be cool if they made an Obi-Wan-style show and focused on an airbender that maybe escaped the attack by the Fire Nation, which I which I wish I could ask Chris as well, but obviously Chris is not here for these shows. Um, I don't know. Now you're getting into changing history, right? You're getting, you're changing history. And with Avatar The Last Airbender having some, is getting a big resurgence. Of course, we've got a live action one coming to Netflix. We've got, you know, uh, Avatar Studios is going to be putting out more content. I don't know about that. And also talking about, Obi-Wan, I mean, we don't really even know what an Obi-Wan style show is yet because we haven't seen the show yet. But look, let's just focus on right now the one coming from Netflix. Netflix, while not every show they do is a knockout of the park, obviously. But most of them are. Other than HBO, nobody does their live series, live television series better than Netflix does. HBO is the king, but if there was a prince, it would be Netflix. And they've got a really good track record of making excellent, excellent, like award-winning television. Not so great at making original movies, but excellent, excellent award-winning television. So I'm going to keep my focus on that. And we were talking a little bit earlier about Paul Sung Young Hee, uh, Ali is, is going to be in that playing Uncle Iroh. So I'm very curious about that. So that's where I'm going to keep my attention for now, Draby. Thanks for writing that in. And yeah, it's too bad that uh, Chris isn't here. She'd totally be all over that question. All right. Next up, Loki's Luscious Locks writes, Hey guys, love the show. Thank you so much, Loki. The Batman was awesome and is getting a lot of well-earned love, but I feel that the relationship between Bruce and Jim Gordon doesn't get enough attention. I absolutely love that weird, dark, semi-buddy cop feel to it. Dude, it's getting attention from me. Every time we've talked about the Batman, one of the things that I've emphasized is that dynamic between um, the James Gordon and Batman character. It's great. Jeffrey Wright and Robert Pattinson's dynamic is wonderful. And they never reveal what their initial contact was, but I get the feeling like Batman must have saved his life at some point because they remember there's that one line of dialogue without giving any big spoilers away, but there's a one line of dialogue where, you know, Batman says, do you trust them? And, you know, Jim Gordon says, Jeffrey Wright says, I don't trust anybody except you. I mean, that's a pretty heavy connection there right that's a pretty big thing to say so i've got a feeling that somewhere in year one of batman's you know doing his thing in gotham he must have saved gordon's life at some point i mean that's the only thing i can think of but yes the dynamic between them loki was absolutely fantastic all right next up loki's luscious locks writes in again one of two maybe i'm basic but i really want to see phoenix's joker with battinson hell no hell no anyway I think those worlds could fit pretty well together. Gotham feels kind of similar in both movies. The friction between the upper and lower class is a theme in both. Um, where's part two? And I don't see a part two. Okay, so I guess you never got around to sending it in. Um, yeah, let me say it again. Hell no. Let me drop an F-bomb. Fuck no. Enough with the bullshit. Everything has to be shared cinematic universe. Enough with that nonsense. All right. Not to mention, Joker would be in his 60s at this point. Because when if you were to say that these were two of the same universe, which clearly is not, just look at, you know, uh, Thomas Wayne. They're two completely different Thomas Waynes. But just look at the ages. Like Joker was in his late 40s, like mid to late 40s in Joker. And Bruce was, what, seven? 
seven? I, I don't know. And now like another 15 years has passed since then, 15, 16, 17 years has passed since then. So what? So you'd have this Robert Pattinson Batman running around for trying to fight a, a, a early to mid 60s Joker? No. No, these are two individual standalone universes that have made fabulous films. Can we not spoil it by playing everything has to be a shared cinematic universe? Yay! Can we not do that? There's plenty of shared cinematic universe stuff out there. Plenty of great shared cinematic universe stuff out there. Let's celebrate that these aren't the same old thing. Can we not just do the same old thing with it, Loki's locks? <laughs> Please, can we not just do that same old bullshit thing that everything's got to be shared cinematic universe with something? So just number one, narratively, it doesn't fit at all, right? It, it just doesn't connect, doesn't make sense. They're complete, two completely different Thomas Waynes. I'm not just talking the actors. I mean, these are two different characters, right? Completely different characters, very, very different Gothams. And on top of all that, you're dealing with a big problem, which is going to be an age thing too. So, uh, I, hey, listen, I respect that you kind of want to see it, and I respect that. I mean, I want some some stuff in movies, too, that maybe not everybody else wants to see. But I got to say, with with all the love of my heart, my film love and brother, I got to say with all the love of my heart, fuck no, don't do that. Please, God, no. I feel like Michael Scott. No! God, no! Why? No! No, don't cross those over, please. That's just my take on it. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on it, though, Loki. Appreciate that, man. All right, next up. Uh, Ian Highland writes, Hey, John and crew. I know John doesn't really enjoy the prequels. No, I I think they're terrible. Uh, there's some there's some things about them that I like. The the pod race scene I think is a fabulous fabulous sequence. Obviously, the lightsaber fight between Qui Gon, Obi Wan, and Darth Maul. You know, there's moments. There's definitely moments. And I myself, as a man born in 1995, grew up with those movies. Uh, it very well might be just nostalgia. But what are your gripes with the prequels, if you have any? Qui Gon is the man. No, I'm not going to do that. I, I would literally be sitting here for hours talking about every single one of the absolute atrocious garbage dumpster fire things about the prequels, but I'm not going to do that. I, I have over the years, I have ex talked about it many, many times. And here's the thing. When the prequels come up, I will mention I hate them. All right. I really don't think they're good, but I don't enjoy talking about things I don't enjoy. I like to focus on the things I like. Now, that, it's unavoidable that once in a while, like we see a movie we don't like and, and we got to talk about it and I got to say why I don't like it, but then I like to move on. I don't like to dwell on it, right? So yeah, when, when the prequels come up, I'll mention, oh, I hated them. Those are terrible, but I'll just move on. I don't, I don't like to sit there and talk about it. Now, let me, I give Rob a hard time. I give, Rob will tell you, I give him a hard time all the time because Rob is very different. Rob would love nothing but to have a eight hour a day streaming show where he just gets to air his grievances about new Star Trek all day, every day. He can't stop talking about it. Right. And that's fine. That's why I get, and I, I give him a hard time for that, but I, I am just not like that. I, I don't like do it. So what I would say is, listen, over the past 20 years, I have explained many times all the long, 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 long laundries of why those films are terrible to me. But I also always said, listen, if you like them, I celebrate that. Like, I want everybody to love every movie they see, even if they're movies that I don't like. And whatever brought you into the Star Wars family is good by me. So if you like them, awesome. But I just, I don't like talking about the things I don't like. I like to focus more on the things that I do like. So, you know, I don't like talking about Clone Wars, but I'll love talking about Rebels, even though they're made by the same guy. But I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of Clone Wars, but I really love Rebels, right? Um, I don't like talking about uh, The Rise of Skywalker, but I love talking about The Force Awakens. You know, I just, I like to spend my time talking about things I like. And I don't ever want to be one of those guys that just, he sits down and just constantly gripes and goes in these long, 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 long diatribes about why that sucks and you're stupid if you like it, right? I don't ever want to be one of those guys. So to answer the question, Ian, 
I have covered this many, 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 many times, and I don't feel like covering it again. It is enough to say that I do not like the prequels, but I'm glad that you do. I celebrate that there are those who really enjoy it and love it. I think that's awesome. And um, let's just focus on the things that, that we enjoy and that we like. All right. Thanks a lot for writing in, man. All right. Next up. I hate sand. Right. Speaking of the last question. Hey, John and crew, we know Obi-Wan will face off against Vader in the series. Would it take place on Tatooine? I don't think so since Anakin slash Vader hates sand. Um, yeah, and I don't know. Maybe it would be like traumatic for him to go back to Tatooine after, you know, the death of his mother, after Shmi, and I, I don't know. I don't know. Now, look, when we see the trailer for Obi-Wan, we see several shots are off Tat Tatooine. But I can't tell for certain if we if any of those shots are Obi-Wan off of Tatooine. I have to go back and watch the trailer again. But I just can't think of off the top of my head if it's absolutely abundantly clear that in this shot, Obi-Wan is not on Tatooine. If Obi-Wan doesn't leave Tatooine in the movie or in the show then obviously any confrontation that happens would have to happen there. Although that's doubtful because if Vader confronted Obi-Wan on Tatooine, he would very well know Obi-Wan is on Tatooine, right? That becomes a problem. So even though I can't think of any scene where Obi-Wan is off Tatooine in the trailer, my guess, and it's just a guess, my guess will be if there's a confrontation between them, that it will be somewhere off planet. I don't know that for sure, but that's my guess. It's a great question, I hate sand. Uh, all right, next up. Uh, Chloe Fanning writes, D rolling. Uh, let's use Jack Nicholson in The Shining, for example. After all of his takes for filming his role in character in The Shining, what are some of the ways an actor can D roll themselves to separate from the character that they have portrayed? Well, you're talking about what's called method acting. And method acting is something, that, and let me be clear here I am not an actor, okay? So I can't really speak to this. But generally speaking, method actors are one who like try to kind of become, inhabit the character and become the character even when they're not on set, right? Uh, Jared Leto right now is, is well known to be a method actor, right? So how do you get away from that role? I don't know, like to me, it just seems like easy. Just stop being that guy. Just think differently. Again, I'm not saying it's that easy. I'm just saying to me, it seems it would be that easy, but I'm not an actor, so I wouldn't know. You know, it's too bad Erin Cummings isn't here because we could ask her that. Erin not, does not consider herself a method actor either, uh, but still she knows some people that employ the method, uh, the, uh, the, the method actor approach. So maybe she could answer this, but I, I honestly don't know. To me, it seems like a simple thing. Like if I, if I play a role-playing game and I'm playing you know, like in my D&D &D group, I play a human paladin and named uh, Darwin. And and I'm trying to think like Darwin. I'm trying to do what Darwin would do. But when the game's over, I just stop thinking about Darwin. So it seems to me like it should be an easy thing. But again, I'm not an actor. <laughs> All right. Thanks for writing that in, Chloe. Next up, we got uh, Jesse the Body V. Of course, a little shout out to Jesse the Body Ventura. I ain't got time to bleed. That Rob Pat's bat suit hides a lot of physical inadequacies. Plus, when he was in civilian clothes, it was baggy. His two shirtless scenes, he just looked regular. Oh, God, no, he did not just look regular. Just, just, just throw that out right now. He did not look just regular. Why was so much made of his intense pre-production workouts if it kind of didn't matter? Well, listen, there is no doubt about it. He was in great shape. But he was also nowhere near like Chris Hemsworth's kind of shape. But like when, for instance, there's there's a shot, and this isn't giving a spoiler away because I'm not going to tell you the context, but there's a shot in the movie where, you know, he's shirtless and he's pushing this giant oak table across a floor, right? And yeah, that dude's, that dude's got some muscles in his back. He's definitely got some muscles in his back. And he's definitely in good shape. And I would... I would propose that before those intense workouts, he probably looked pretty scrawny. I, I, I've always gotten the impression, you know, I've, I've sat in a room and I've talked with Robert Pattinson on a couple of occasions. Granted, it's been a few years since I've done that, but I have sat in a chair across from Robert Pattinson on a couple of occasions, right? A finely tuned athlete, he is not. And it's fine. But when you compare that guy 
compared to the one that we saw in the Batman, who is clearly in pretty good shape. Again, he's not rocking out the Chris Evans physique or the Ryan Reynolds physique or the Thor physique, but he looked like that Batman image of the more lean ninja kind of fighter than he would of the other kind of image of Batman, the, the Ben Affleck kind of big, brawny uh, Batman that that uh, Ben Affleck was trying to portray. So to say he just kind of looked regular, I wholeheartedly disagree. I know a lot of people. Most people do not look like Robert Pattinson looks like in this movie. He, he looks like he's in really, really good shape. And I would say, what was the point of all that exercising? Because I bet one year prior to starting shooting that, he looked significantly smaller. So, um, so yeah, that would be my take on it at any rate, Jesse. All right, next up. Saxy Apprentice writes, Rotten Tomatoes is great for showing how many people generally like or dislike a movie. I prefer to look at IMDb more often because the number of stars can indicate the average degree of passion amongst viewers. The demographics shown are interesting too. I will tell you I completely disagree with you, Saxy Apprentice, and, and here's primarily why. I have said for a long time that IMDb review, uh, like uh, uh, audience scores are absolute rubbish and useless because of one big prime factor. You don't have to have seen a movie in order to register a vote on it. And we have seen campaigns done by groups online to go and bomb an IMDb rating for a movie by people who've never seen the movie or to vote up a movie on IMDb regardless of whether or not people have even seen it. It's an easily manipulated system that carries no credibility. And I also felt the same way for a long time about Rotten Tomatoes audience scores. Because for, the, for a long time, anybody can just go like, uh, what's a movie I haven't seen? I haven't seen The Northman yet, right? So let's just pretend The Northman opened in theaters today and I hadn't seen it yet. Nothing would have stopped me from going on Rotten Tomatoes or IMDb right now and click awful or click awesome, you know, zero or 10 fresh or rotten, right? Nothing stopping me from doing that. Now, a couple of years ago, Rotten Tomatoes made a change that was fantastic. They made a change that only people who they can verify actually saw the movie get to register a vote. That's fantastic. And the way they do it is through their Fandango service because Fandango and Rotten Tomatoes are owned by the same company. So if you're on Rotten Tomatoes and you want to register as a regular viewer, you want to register for, let's say the Northman is now out and you saw the Northman and you loved it and you want to go on, well, Rotten Tomatoes knows if you have a Fandango account and if so, did you actually get tickets and go and see the Northman, and if so, you are able to vote. And that is why now on Rotten Tomatoes, it says verified votes. So no matter how much people hate a movie or how much people love a movie, you know that all the votes being registered there are by people who actually saw the movie. On IMDb, there is no such protection. And we've seen many instances where people just organize vote up or vote down campaigns, whether or not they've seen the movie or not. It's it's useless. It means nothing. So that's why I would suggest that today, for at least theatrical movies, if you're going to look at any audience scores, the only audience score I would trust is the one on Rotten Tomatoes because it at least verifies that the people voting on that have actually seen the movie in question. And to me, that means a lot. It may not mean a lot to you, and that's fine, but to me, that means a lot, and that's why I've been saying for many, many, many years, audience ratings, uh, particularly on IMDb, are, are kind of pointless and useless, at least to me. But I'm glad you like them, man. All right, next up. Uh, yeah, never mind. I'm not even going to read that. All right, next up. The Organic Pig Rights. There are so many good Pixar movies that it is very difficult for me to choose my top favorite. That's one of the great things about Pixar. One of my favorite is Inside Out. I think this is the most creative and complex of them all and like many has a very powerful message. I Listen, I agree with you that I think Inside Out is absolutely, how did you describe it? Uh, it is the most creative and complex 
at least emotionally of all that. They go into some really deep themes in Inside Out. Again, I it's not in my top three favorite Pixar films, but it is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And by the time you get to the end of the movie, when you realize that what this little girl needed, because remember the, the Amy Puller character, I think her character was happiness or joy. Her whole thing was try, don't let our girl be sad. Let's not let her be sad. But then you get to the end and you realize that she needed to feel the pain. She needed to embrace the fact that she was indeed sad. That she grieved losing her home, her friends, everything that she has known to uproot and move into a totally new place where she was alone and blah, blah, blah. And in order to truly be healthy, she had to hurt. She had to be allowed to feel that hurt. And I'll tell you what, it is one of the most profound things I've ever seen like communicated in an animated film before. It was beautiful and it was organic. It was so well done. And you you couldn't help but choke up a little bit at the end. I mean, it, it's just, it's an awesome movie, Organic Pig. It's an awesome movie. All right, uh, next up, we've got James L.H. writes, uh, Regards Kenobi, I'm behind on Star Wars animation, so no problem with the look of this Inquisitor. I'm looking forward to seeing Rupert Friend, a uh, good actor, especially if you've seen him in Homeland. Yeah, and he is quite good. But let me talk for a second about the look of Inquisitor. Like when you hear some people like me saying, I'm not really thrilled with the look of the Inquisitor, it has nothing to do with whatever comparisons to what they look like in the animated thing. That's not it at all. I just like take that out of it entirely take rebels out of it entirety and the animated inquisitors take them out of the the scenario completely just look at that character and when i just look at that character in the obi-wan trailer i don't think it looks very good but who cares he sounds really good like that whole narration that he does like the the secret to hunting jedi is patience like right like it's I can already tell I'm going to really like this character. And if the if you like the character, what he looks like will not matter. It won't matter. But right now, being on the outside looking in, having not seen the show yet, and just seen a glimpse of the look of the character in a trailer, yeah, I'll say I don't think the character looks all that great. I really don't. I don't think it looks all that great right now. And that has nothing to do with the cartoon. But will that matter? Not if we like the character. And... If we see the character in a different light or different context, maybe we'll start to like the look of the character a little bit more. That's absolutely possible too. But again, at the end of the day, the look won't be that important. It'll be, do we like the character? Does the character come across as menacing and interesting and deeply layered? If he does, we're going to love the character. It won't matter what he looks like. All right, thanks for writing that in, James. Next up, James LH also writes, my latest film, The Duke, uh, Jim Broadbent and Helen Mirren, that came out just a couple of years ago. I have not seen that one, despite the fact that I love Jim Broadbent and Helen Mirren. Who doesn't love Helen Mirren? But Jim Broadbent, who, like, the first time I really started to love Jim Broadbent was in Moulin Rouge, uh, which I think the character's name is Ziegler in uh, Moulin Rouge. I love him in Moulin Rouge, but I did not see The Duke anyway. In 61, Goya's painting of Duke of Wellington was stolen to bring attention to elderly care. Fun fact, a copy of the painting was used in Dr. No, as it was still uh, missing the in-joke was Dr. No stole it. I'm not really following you here, James, but I think that's probably because I did not see the Duke. So, but anyway, good on you for bringing up a film that I didn't see and I missed, I missed on that one, but I really should catch up on because I do love Jim Broadbent and Helen Mirren, so I should catch up on that. Thanks for writing that in, Jim, or James, I should say. All right, next up, James L.H. also writes, also, as it is now part of the John Campy Show lexicon, the game... The genre planetary intercourse, and you can thank Ray for that, created by Ray. How about a triple bill? When worlds collide, moonfall, and uh, melancholia, uh, all planetary in intercourse you need. God, I still... Uh, here's the thing about Ray. And I know this is what you're asking about, James, but let me bring this up about Ray, because a lot of people will ask me sometimes, you know, most people get it. Most people completely get it. 
but some don't, and th and that's uh, that's fine, and that's understandable because some people write into me, like they was, John, I don't get it. Like, why is Ray on the show? Ray does not have, and he'll be the first person to tell you this. He does not have a wide breadth of movie knowledge. I mean, he jokes about, but he's serious. Like he'll sleep through really long movies. You know, why is Ray there? And my response to that is simply, you got to understand what his role here is. His primary role is not as a film commentator, because you'll, you'll notice as we go through the main topics, like if we have like five main topics in a show, maybe we'll ask him his opinion once on a main topic. Like he'll get more involved in the conversation when we get into the live comments and questions. But on average, probably like once, we'll go to him and he'll chime in on, on a main topic. His number one main reason to be here is so that people can see someone on camera who is, for people who are watching live, who is at that moment, live and in the moment, interacting with them in the live chat. And honestly, I've heard from a lot of people who watch the show live every day say they, it makes all the difference in the world. Actually having somebody on the show, because, you know, I'm actively engaging, I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating on the show, what I'm saying, doing all the camera switching, controlling the audio, bringing the images in and out and all that kind of stuff. Rob is trying to stay focused on what the conversation is and what we're talking about. Ray, he can be very distracted, and that's fine because he's focusing on the live chat. But it's such a difference when people see the person on camera is right here with us in the live chat, and that's the main thing. And Ray is so funny and personable and likable that he's just a great personality to have in the live chat. The second, so he's not here to be a film commentator. He is here to be in that live chat with everybody, and they see him on camera, and he's in there live. But the second great thing about having him in the show is this. I, I've known Ray now for over a decade. Obviously, he's my brother-in-law, right? I, I married his sister. But he is simply one of the most funny guys to be around I've ever met. And there's a joyous uh, magnetism. There's, there's a joyous magnetism about him. People are just drawn to Ray because of this joyous enthusiasm and, uh, and, and fun he brings to everything. And... I love, and I know Chris loves, and I know Rob loves just having him in the room. He just, he makes us have more fun. Like us in the room, having Ray here makes it more fun. And I totally believe, and Ray and Rob believes this too, that if we're having more fun, it makes the show better. And so that's why Ray is here. And planetary intercourse is just... One of the examples of how and why that works. All right. Thanks for writing that in, James. All right. Next up, we go over to Garden Variety Vagabond, who writes, In its 13th week, Spider-Man made over $4 million domestically this weekend. In context, Belfast, eight, uh, week 18, has made a total domestic of $8.9 million. Licorice Pizza, week 16, has made $16.7 million total. West Side Story, week 14, has made $38 million total. And the Great Moonfall Week Six has made nineteen total. I mean, yeah, but that's 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 not a good comparison. Like, if you want to say in comparison, say take Shang Chi in the same week number. I mean, Spider Man No Way Home will still be dwarfed from those numbers, but that's a little bit more of a comparable example. Compare like, oh, by week. 13 Endgame has been making this thing. Again, maybe not totally fair, but it's a more applicable thing. Comparing Spider-Man, a big popular comic book movie, to a very artistic black and white um, personal, you know, little film like Belfast is not, does not really give you any context. You know what I'm saying? So if you're going to try to set context, you got to try to put some things in there that are a little bit more comparable. So whether it's something like Venom, or whether it's something, like I said, Shang-Chi, or something that, what else had a, had a decently long run? I, I, like Joker, or uh, Infinity War, or like that's what you should bring in for those weekly numbers to say for context. Comparing to, it to, to films that are 
not remotely ever supposed to be even close to that sort of thing. It's a totally different genre altogether. I don't know that that gives us much context. But look, regardless of that, the run that Spider-Man has been on is nothing short of absolutely phenomenal. All right. The Good Old Days writes, Hey, John and Rob, just John here today. Just want to say you have uh, an amazing team and love your show. Thank you so much. I really do have a great team here. I'm really, I, I just love it. I was down a YouTube rabbit hole this weekend and was watching old clips of Collider Movie Talk with Campia Ellis, Harloff, and Schnepp. I loved you guys together. Uh, you guys had amazing chemistry. I think I know the answer, but it's. Uh, but I'm going to ask anyway. Is there any chance of you getting Ellis or Harloff or both uh, for like guest spots on the John Campy show. I know it's a long shot, but I just thought I would ask, love the show. Thanks. And bring on the filthy. All right. Thanks for writing that in. Well, look, Christian has done small, uh, guest spots on the show. Uh, I have had Mark Ellis do a guest spot on the show. Now, not for a full show, but for a small segment, I had him on. Look, but the, the reality is this. While I love Christian. I'm actually, I was just on the phone with Christian yesterday. I actually gave, normally it's Christian calling me asking for some input or advice. But yesterday, I actually called Christian looking for some input and advice. Uh, I was just on the phone with Christian yesterday. Uh, and I, I think Christian's great. He always knows I'm always going to have his back. I know he's always going to have mine. But Christian has his own network that he's working on, Right. Like, besides the Schmodown, which is a huge thing for him to work on, he's also got uh, his own separate stuff that he's doing there, and he simply does not have time to be coming and doing stuff on my show. On top of that, something I've been very, very careful to try to avoid, and, and by the way, I've had, like, Dennis Zen, who still comes over and watches UFC with me, or I'll, I'll go out to L.A. and we'll go out to a bar or something, stuff like that. Like I, Dennis Zen is one of the oldest friends, like one of the first friends I ever made in L.A., and we, we still hang out. But I, I've only had Dennis on, I think, once or twice. I, from the day that I left... I determined that what I would not do is try to create AMC or Collider 2.0. Now, when Rob was kind of irrationally and unjustifiably cast adrift from Collider, um, he was never a staff person. He was never on staff at Collider or anything like that. Uh, but, but Rob and I had done a lot of shows together. I thought we had a really good working shorthand together. I thought we worked very well together. And I wanted a regular guest. And I thought, well, you know, he was never on staff. He was never blah, blah. So, yeah, I reached out to him and I asked him if he wanted to come and start working with me. To which he did immediately. There was a narrative going around for a while that John stole Rob from Collider. No, no, I did not. Make no mistake about it. Collider cast him off. Um... And, and I won't go into the reasons, they're not my reasons to share, but I'll just say extremely, it was Bush League. It was dirty the way Robert Meyer Burnett was done at Collider. It was completely dirty. Um, but he was cast off by Collider. And then I reached out to him and said, hey, if you're not going to be there, would you like to come and work with me? So there was, there was like this, some kind of narrative, I don't know how it started going, but there was some kind of narrative going around for a while that I poached Robert from Clyder. That never happened. That never happened. That being said, I felt comfortable since he was never a staff person at Collider and stuff like that, and he was never on the core movie talk show or anything like that. I didn't feel like I was in any trouble of creating the impression or the appearance that I was recreating Collider 2.0 or, or something like that, right? I just never felt that. However, if for whatever reason, Mark Ellis, who is stupidly funny, talented, I mean, I, I, there's, there's not enough adjectives I can put in to talk about Mark Ellis and how great he is. But I, I don't think, and I'm never say never, I'm never going to say never, but I just feel like if I were to bring Mark Ellis on, not that, not that he's hurting for a job because he's very busy. He's doing Rotten Tomato stuff. He's doing great. But if, for whatever reason, I just feel like if I brought Mark Ellis in, it would kind of start to feel like I was creating Collider 2.0. 
And I don't want to do that. And if I were to bring Christian on, it would just kind of feel like we were recreating Collider 2.0. And I don't want to do that. Now, again, I never say never. I, I'm not going to say never. But uh, fortunately, you know, neither of these guys are hurting for a gig. They're both doing incredibly great stuff, and that's wonderful. Um, and I think from time to time, you'll still see Christian pop on in a quick, like, five-minute guest spot. And maybe we'll have Ellis pop in again for another five-minute guest spot. Maybe once in a blue moon, you might see Dennis then, just because I'm so tight with Dennis. Um, but, yeah, what, what I don't ever want to do is create something that makes it look like I'm trying to get the band back together again, you know? I, I have moved on past that. I have, I've moved well on past that. And, um, and, yeah, but those guys are all doing a great. I think they're all awesome. All right, thanks for writing that in, good old days. I appreciate you asking. All right, next up, Dangerous D writes, Hey, John, I was in a rehab facility for a year. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that, man. I won't bore you uh, on why, but the thing I missed the most was going to movies. And if I was going to be able, if I was going be able to then, I thought that why don't this rehab and long-term live in the facility have a place to watch current movies? Uh, that's on theaters now. That's on in theaters now. They could make a deal with movie theaters to be like their extended location. They could broadcast it when the movie opens for one or two nights. There, there are a halls or common areas that are big enough to have two shows. It's a win-win. No, that'll never happen. That'll never happen. Okay, so first of all, um, and by the way, I, I, it sounds like you're no longer in the rehab facility, which I'm, I'm very glad to hear. First of all, there's you're under a misconception that that's a movie theater's decision. That like AMC movie theaters can decide, hey, you know what? Let's play Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness at the local community center. That's not the movie theater's decision. That that's not th that's not for them to do. That's for the studio to do. Right? The movie theaters have no authority to take the movie studio's movies and play it somewhere else. So that has, number one, just to clear up that misconception, that has nothing to do with the movie theaters. Okay, It has zero to do with the movie theaters. The movie theaters have no authority uh, to authorize the playing of movies in some other public places. The movie theaters have nothing to do with that at whatsoever. So just be clear on that. The second thing is, um, the studios have a very sealed distribution system, right? It's very sealed. It's very controlled. They know exactly where their movies are, how their movies are playing, who they're playing in front of. It's a very controlled, tight system. Having them just play in various facilities. Now, there are obviously upsides to that, but I just don't think it's something studios to do. Not to mention, it would probably violate the agreements that studios have with theaters because theaters pay money. There are, there are very complex legal agreements between exhibitors, the movie theaters, and the distributors, the movie studios, about territory rights, where it can play. You know, like... Because a movie theater, they don't want you playing now the movie in a whole bunch of different facilities as well either. So it would be the responsibility of the studio, but the studio would have to make sure they're not breaking their agreements with the movie. It's just too close of a system. So no, I don't see that happening. Um, I think the best situation is like second run movies. So, you know, like movies like, what's a movie like Free Guy? I mean, Free Guy's now on Disney Plus, but let's say Free Guy just finished his theatrical run. It was out in theaters for like nine weeks. It hasn't come onto streaming services yet, but hey, yeah, movies like that, there's more wiggle room there to do stuff like that. So maybe that's an option they can look at, uh, Dangerous D. Thanks for writing in the idea. All right, next up, we go to uh, Din Jar uh, Jar Jarin, who writes, Hey, John and crew, have you seen the news that the Batman and No Way Home composer Michael G. Aquino will direct a Marvel's Werewolf by Night Disney Plus Halloween special? This will be his directorial debut. Thoughts? Yeah, I heard about that. This is very interesting. I have no idea whether this is great news because, quite frankly, just because somebody is really good at cooking steak does not mean they're very good at designing a skyscraper. And make no mistake, that's what we're talking about here. 
So like I, I, I remember somebody, a friend of mine wrote to me on Twitter and it's like, oh my God, isn't this amazing? Michael G. Kino is going to be directing this. That's awesome. I'm like, why on earth would you think that's awesome? What have we ever seen that tells us that Michael G. Aquino knows how to direct? Nothing. He might be the worst director in the world. He could also be great. I'm just saying we don't know. And this is a good kind of project. Like, because this isn't like the next Avengers movie. This isn't like some, or the next Guardians of the Galaxy movie. This isn't some big, super high profile tentpole project. This is the type of movie you want a new director to cut their teeth on, right? It's, it's a little bit smaller. This is not a big theatrical wide release film. It gives him something to cut his teeth on. And so I'm intrigued. I, I will say that right now. As for now, I am intrigued. Let's see how it works out for GQ. Because I don't personally know a lot of full-time, famous, successful movie composers who transitioned into being a director. So uh, that alone makes it pretty fascinating. All right, next up, we've got uh, Michael Evans who writes, Hey, John and team. Just watched your Dark Knight Movie Club video. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. But was wondering how you, Rob and Ray, went 90 minutes without mentioning the Look at Me hostage video or the dead copycat Batman hitting the window. So many great scenes, I guess. Honestly, to me, those are rather irrelevant scenes. I mean, look, I'm not saying they're bad scenes, but they're not pivotal or directly tied in, like, really intricately with the, what the overall story was. Now, look, in Movie Club, yeah, the whole video goes about 90 minutes, but less than half of that is dedicated to just us talking about it. And then the rest is what the rest of the movie club, our audience, wants to write in and talk about. Um, and yeah, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Michael Evans. I've never given either of those scenes a single thought, to be honest with you. I, again, not that they're bad scenes. I don't personally see them as being very pivotal to the movie or any of the direct plot lines that are running in it. So that's probably was it. Like when you're saying, I just wonder how you guys never mentioned the... I don't know, the the pencil scene or how you never mentioned the getting the, the Chinese gangster out of China or something like, like something big and pivotal. But yeah, uh, for, for those, eh, yeah, I'm not surprised. I could talk about the Dark Knight for three hours and I probably would never mention those. Just to be honest with you, I probably wouldn't. But I'm glad that they stand out to you, man. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. All right, Brad B. writes, can we talk about how hot Zoe Kravitz is? Uh, that her mask thing did not cover her face at all. They were not hiding that gorgeous face, and she did a great job on SNL this past week, too. Now, I mean, look, there's no getting around. Zoe Kravitz, male or female, is one of the most one of the more attractive human beings walking around on the face of the earth right now. I, I, no doubt about that. She completely is. What, of course, is more important, because, listen, uh, people don't get this. I live in L.A., well, I live outside of L.A. now. I live out in Riverside now, so I'm an hour outside of L.A. But for the most part, I live in L.A. And I've lived in L.A. for, for, for a long time now. And one of the first things I learned when I moved to L.A. was that I can throw a quarter in the air and it will bounce off of seven extremely hot people before that quarter hits the ground. Male or female, it's going to bounce off like seven stupidly hot people before it hits the ground, right? So yeah, Zoe Kravitz is an incredibly attractive human being, no doubt. But there's a lot of them in L.A. Just believe me, there's a lot of them in L.A. What makes Zoe Kravitz special is her talent. I mean, it's amazing that, you know, she's Lenny Kravitz's daughter, but she has shown time and time again, she can really act, and she was great. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think she's Oscar level or anything like that right now, but she's very gifted because hot people believe me when I tell you they're easy to come across in LA. If I take you for dinner to downtown Burbank, you're going to walk across a dozen or two dozen people, male or female that you think are better looking than Zoe Kravitz. I mean, she's extremely beautiful, obviously, but I'm saying that's LA is littered with people like that, which is why I fit in so well because game recognizes game. You, you know how it is, you know, you know, uh, but but honestly, what really makes her stand apart and what made her great in Catwoman was the fact that she played the role really well. And, and that's what I really like seeing. And I'm very interested in seeing how far her career can actually go. All right. Next up, Andre Porter writes, hey, guys, so sad that William Hurt passed me too, man. Other than the MCU, my exposure to Hurt was him being awarded an honorary doctoral, uh, probably doctorate uh, from my alma, alma mater 
the University of the Arts in the late 2000s during my college career. Yeah, we talked about that, obviously, on the John Camby show earlier today. I, I was so sad to hear about that. I loved William Hurt. He was one of my favorite actors. And again, a guy who pulled off the rare feat of being nominated for Best Actor at the, at the Academy Awards. Not one, not two, but three years in a row. Uh, for Kiss of the Spider Woman, uh, Newsroom, and uh, Children of a Lesser God. Like, that dude was so good. So good. And, of course, modern audiences, younger audiences, why well, he was a General Thunderbolt Ross. Yes, but he's also an Academy Award winner. <laughs> like, he won the best, best Actor of the Academy Awards and was nominated multiple other times. And, yeah, I was really, really sad to hear about his passing, Andre. All right, next up. Uh, Jared Dyer writes, Hey, guys, what do you think of this idea for Deadpool 3? Deadpool kills the Fox universe. Mm, nah. Uh, gives gives us the opportunity to see Hugh and Ryan interact as Deadpool and Wolverine. Thanks and have a great day. Well, I mean, you can, you can come up with anything. And here's the great thing, Jared. It's like you literally could come up with anything to have Ryan and Hugh on screen together, right? Like Deadpool kills, uh, kills the Marvel universe. You don't have to draw on that story to, to have an excuse to have Hugh Jackman in his Wolverine. I mean, Hugh Jackman's not going to be Wolverine again. I hope whatever happens, especially now with Sean Levy, who has worked with Hugh Jackman in Real Steel, with Sean Levy directing Deadpool 3, I hope they found a way to bring in Hugh Jackman. I really do. It probably wouldn't be as Wolverine. But, um, yeah, I I don't know. I Listen, I, I like the more personal stories of Deadpool. And really, as bonkers as they've been, Deadpool 1 and 2 both been at their core very personal stories about a man's love for a woman and the man's loss. And so I would like to see something a little bit more in there. That That's just me. But, I mean, obviously, Kevin Feige could find an idea like this year to make something really fun out of it if he wanted to. All right, thanks for sharing that, dude. All right, next up, James Barron writes, Hey, guys, I just wanted to point, because I know it's already past its second weekend, I have seen the Batman 15 times, including watching it at the theater I work at. Which film have you seen the most in theaters, and how would you rate it? Thank you. All right, so it's kind of funny that you ask this question as I take a sip here. It's kind of funny that you ask this question because I just gave this soliloquy about how I don't like talking about the prequels. Like When the prequels come up, I'll mention I don't like them. I think they're terrible. But, you know, if you love them, that's awesome. I celebrate that. But I don't want to spend my time talking about them. Because I don't want to just be negative. Like, I'd rather focus and talk about the things that I really like. And I've talked about all the things I don't like about the prequels many, 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 dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times over the past couple of decades. I don't need to do it anymore. But, in asking the question, what movie I've seen most in theaters, the answer to that question is Star Wars The Phantom Menace. I believe... My theater count on that one was 19 times. Now, you may rightfully say, John, why did you see a movie you dislike so much 19 times? I will tell you. So the first time I saw Star Wars The Phantom Menace, I don't know. I think it could have been two hours of George Lucas making talking faces with his hairy ass, going, hi, I'm, I'm in Star Wars. And I probably would have said, that was awesome, because I, was, I had already pre-brainwashed myself into liking that movie. And then when I saw it, went back to watch it again, I liked it a little bit less, but I don't know, but that was still good, just not as good as I thought it was. And then when I saw it a third time, I'm like, no, okay, no, it was okay. The movie's okay. Then the fourth time I saw it, I'm like, this movie isn't very good. And then the fifth time I saw it, it's like, oh yeah, this movie's trash. But I had convinced myself for a while that it was really good. And, and then I, I got over that. And, and really, that hasn't, that hasn't happened to me since. In like the 20-whatever years since The Phantom Menace came out, that's not happened to me again since. But here's the other thing, is that at that time that The Phantom Menace came out, I was working at a visual effects company. And The Phantom Menace... I personally think, even more so than Jurassic Park, I don't think there's ever been a movie in cinematic history that made that big of a leap forward in visual effects than Star Wars The Phantom Menace. And I still believe that to this day. And 
what we would do at the office is we would have what we would call staff meetings. And what staff meeting meant was let's drive by Costco quick and get a $2 hot dog and soda and then eat them in the car on the way to this little mall that had like $5 movies and Star Wars The Phantom Mess was playing there and we would just go and marvel at the visual effects. Marvel at the visual effects. And granted, over the subsequent 15, 16 times that we saw the movie, we liked it less and less and less and less and less, but still never lost our awe and wonder over the visual effects accomplishments in that movie. Mm. To this day, though I say I think Phantom Menace is a piece of garbage, the, the bonus features on the Phantom Menace DVD is either the best or tied for the best ever put on a DVD with the Lord of the Rings bonus features. The behind the scenes stuff, how they made the effects work and all that kind of stuff is just absolutely fascinating to me. So actually, ironically, James, my answer to the movie I've seen most in theaters is Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, a movie I don't even like. But that that's why I saw it that many times. All right. Thanks for adding that in, man. Next up, Miguel A. Uh, uh, Velasquez writes, Hey, John and Rob, just me here today. Have you guys heard the rumor that Batflick is shooting a cameo in The Flash? Uh, well, I'll address that in a second. And that he might return to the DCU. He's not returning to the DCU. Uh, would you guys like a separate Batman maybe every other year, or is that too much Batman? In my opinion, no, never too much. Okay, so first things first. Have I heard the rumor that Batfleck is shooting a cameo in The Flash? All right, that's not a rumor. That is confirmed fact that we have known for two years. Just so you know, that Ben Affleck is appearing in The Flash is a confirmed fact that has been confirmed for two years, at least since the first DC fandom. And before that, I believe word came out about that, I believe. So, um, yeah, that information has been out there a very, very, very long time. So there's that. The rumors he might return to the DCU. No, he's not. He's not returning to the DCU. And we don't need another Batman running around. We really don't. Now, Ben Affleck is my favorite Batman, and I would sing to the skies if they announced he was returning because I want his I want a Ben Affleck written by, directed by Batman movie. Absolutely I do. That being said, it's an overcrowded thing right now. Because Robert Pattinson's got his Batman movies going. And we're going to have a Michael Keaton Batman running around in The Flash. He's going to be in uh, Batgirl. And then what? we're going to introduce another Batman? It's, it's too much. It's too much. So, I don't know. I, I mean, I really don't think he will be. But, I mean, if they did, you're going to see me wearing a party hat and one of those things you, you blow in and go and make the sound you know this, this anyway you're gonna see me throw a party on this show if they ever do you're gonna see me throw a party on this show even if it's a party by myself but no I, I don't believe that's happening at all Miguel unfortunately all right next up Miguel also writes hey John I still remember your rant about Adam Aaron <laughs> he's the CEO of AMC uh one of the great rants I've seen lots of passion also your hate for Chapek I, let me be clear I don't hate Bob Chapek I really don't like the job he's doing. I, I really don't. But I will still advocate that we need to give him more time to see if he can get this ship turned around, even though I am 100%, I do not like the job he's doing. But I do not hate Bob Chapek um, or anything like that, and I'm still cheering for him. I just don't think he's done a very good job so far. Anyway, also, your hate for Chapek, maybe a rant later. Anyways, my question to you is, if you had to hire a CEO to run your show, who would you choose, Aaron or Chapek? Oh, obviously, no, neither. I think I'd rather just let my my company shut down. Because, I, yeah, either way, my, either one of those guys running my company, my company would be destined to shutting down and be run into the ground. So my answer to that, uh, no, I really don't like Adam Aaron. Now, let me, let me preface that by saying I've never met the man. He might be just a delightful human being for all I know, okay? So I'm not saying anything about his character or his personality, but 
In his role as CEO of AMC Theaters, it is my opinion that he has acted incredibly shady, taking credit for things that he should not be taking credit for, and really actively not only hurting the future of his company, but hurting the future of the industry as a whole. But that's just one. Uh, Bob Chapek, I just don't think he's done a good job, but I, I still hold out hope that he can turn around. I, I have no hope that Adam Aaron can turn anything around. I think that guy is just the wrong guy to be there, but that's just me. All right. Uh, Bogey writes, uh, rest in peace, Bogey, Rob's mom's rescue cat. I have a great admiration for anybody who rescues animals, as do I. I mean, our dogs are rescues, just so you know. Uh, she's a hero. I hope Rob's mom can find solace in knowing she provided an animal with a loving home. Please give Bunker, that's the name of her other cat, extra cuddles from a fan. Yeah. Now, now look, everybody knows I do not like cats, even though I grew up with cats. Like uh, my first pet was a cat named Luke Skywalker. Uh, and then my family had a, had a lovely cat named Sarah that was a stray. She just showed up when my family moved into the Campia Ranch. Shortly after we moved into the Campia Ranch, this cat showed up at the door. And my mom took it in and she became a part of the family for like 10 years. Sarah and Sarah passed away recently. But I am not a cat person. I'm not a cat. I am more like a, a Ron, Ron Burgundy not Ron Burgundy, a Ron Swanson philosophy that cats are useless, that, you know, sort of thing. Uh, that is me. But yes, res people who do rescue animals are great. I mean, my dog Shadow is a rescue. We, we got her and we rescued her and she's been a part of our family now for like nine years. Uh, and we love her and all that kind of stuff. So yes. All right, next up. Uh, Pixar, is that you, writes? I wanted to like turning red, but May twerking at her mom was too much. I already had a hard time with the animation style. I thought the animation style was beautiful. Uh, this weird Wallace and Gromit chicken run looking animation is distracting. Oh, I disagree. Uh, did they have a low budget? Are you kidding? Are you kidding? Anyway, uh, it doesn't feel like Pixar. Oh, it absolutely feels like Pixar. Every Pixar film has its own kind of look to it, right? Uh, unless you're getting into certain series like Toy Story, they all have a certain look to it and stuff like that. But May May like doing, shaking her uh, panda butt at her mom. That is exactly, again, I say this as a guy who grew up with two sisters that were six and five years younger than me. A 12 or 13 year old, super angry at their mom. If you don't think that is exactly what they would do, I don't know what to tell you because that's exactly what they would do. They would do whatever they think would enrage their mom. And it must drive, drive mothers absolutely crazy. But yeah, that is exactly what they would do. And the animation in this movie is phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. And yeah, so I I mean, I respect where you're coming from on that, but I I cannot identify at all with what it is you're saying that, oh, you know, it didn't even feel like Pixar or what, was it low? But I, hey, listen, all due respect to, we all have our different perceptions and, and things like that of movie of the movies we watch, and it's all valid. But I all I can say to you, dude, is I cannot identify with anything that you're saying in there, like at all. But hey, that's the beautiful thing about film, man. We can all have different perceptions and different experiences with it, and it's all good. Thank you for sharing your perception of that. All right. Next up. Dr. Nova writes. Uh, what I would do with streaming. My streaming services, let me try this again. What I would do with streaming my streaming services is if you want your own computer, then $10. If you want a family account, $30. And if you link up to, say, five accounts, it's exactly what YouTube Premium does and would work out well since they track IP addresses. Yeah, but here's the thing. I don't think that's what streaming services want to do. Streaming services want everybody to pay for their own thing. That is the number one thing right now that is going to increase revenue for these streaming services is that, hey, if you want a membership to our streaming services, you got to pay for it. Like at my gym membership, like I, I, Ann and I are members of the UFC gym. We've been, you know, working out and training at the UFC gym for, I don't know, well over 10 years now. But I don't get to go, oh, yeah, Ray, you want to go work out here? Take my membership card. Go work out. No, no, no. That, that's not the way it works. My membership that I pay for is for me. 
And the streaming services have been very lenient about that for years, but I really think you're going to see them cracking down on that. And it's not good business. Their, their, their perception will be it's not good business to say, oh, you can pay for three memberships, but you can have five or six people use it. That's not to their advantage. They'll probably have it. No, you have it. You can use it. Um, so, I mean, it's one thing to say I would do it this way, but you might find if it was actually your money and you were actually doing, you might find that it's not that profitable. And remember what YouTube is doing is a completely different set of, is a completely different set of context from what the streaming services are doing. It's a very, very different thing. So I don't know whether you compare it, but they got to figure out a solution one way or the other, Dr. Nova. So maybe they can take some influence from that. I, I don't know. We'll find out. All right. Next up, uh, Trevor Summers writes. Hi, all. With the announcement that Discovery Plus and HBO Max will merge into one, is this a sign we will get HBO Max here in England? Maybe. Uh, we get Discovery Plus already, but no HBO. I need to know I can watch the Batman spinoffs. I still haven't seen Peacemaker here. Oh, and that sucks. Yeah, I get emails every once in a while from, from our international friends who watch the John Campus show that haven't had a chance to watch Peacemaker yet, and that's crazy. Um, the honest answer is I don't know. Because there are territorial licensing rights. I mean, the only reason HBO isn't there isn't because HBO doesn't want to be in England. Of course they want to be there. But there are licenses and territorial rights and things like that and a lot of red tape that has to be cleared. Could merging with Discovery that is there already, could that hasten HBO getting in there? I really don't know because I don't know the legalese of it all. And that's what this is all about. It's all about the legalese of pre-existing contracts and agreements. Because you know HBO wants to be, <clears throat> pardon me, you know HBO wants to be there as soon as they possibly can. They absolutely want to be there. But can they? Don't know. And, and, and maybe this Discovery merger can speed that along, but I'm not really sure, to be honest with you. It may not. I hope you guys can get it really soon, though. All right. Final question of the day comes to us from James uh, Bonner. By the way, I I'm going to let you guys know I say final question of the day. There might be some of you who have sent in questions by the time you watch this video and say, wait a minute, I didn't see mine yet. Well, by the time I put these all together, a bunch more questions have come in, so those will have to get answered on the next uh, mailbag show on Wednesday. So just keep your guys' eyes open for that. Okay. But for now, the final question for right now, James Bonner writes in a $20 super chat. Thank you, James, for supporting our channel on that level, dude. And he writes, good morning, everyone. Well, it's later in the evening right now. Uh, watch the Batman this Saturday. I really enjoyed it. However, as many pointed out, the three-hour runtime was unnecessary. They could have shaved off 15 minutes without harming the plot. I agree. Now, look, normally, when I say a movie could have been shortened by 15, 20, or 30 minutes, that is usually accompanied by me saying that the movie dragged in places. That is not the case here. I, I don't feel like this movie ever dragged. Like, yeah, I do feel it could have been shorter and maybe should have been shorter. But as but because I really did look at the movie as a whole, I think it could have been compacted, been just as affected, uh, just as effective, but had a shorter runtime. But that doesn't mean I'm suggesting that the movie ever felt like it dragged in places to me. Some people feel like it did, and I respect that. But for me, I never felt like it dragged. It still could have been shorter, but I never felt like it dragged. And that's a key distinction. So. It'll be interesting to see, you know, what Matt Re what lessons Matt Reeves learns from the first movie. Is the second movie also three hours? Does he try to shave that down to about 240 or something like that? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Anyway, thanks for writing that in, James. And guys, that'll do it for this installment of Mailbag. Thank you so much for being here and making this show part of your day. Big special thank you to all you guys who sent in those comments and questions. Number one, because you gave us great fun things to talk about, but number two, you supported this channel as you did it, and all of us involved with the channel, thank you guys so very much for your support. Okay, guys, don't forget to come back for the John Campion Show tomorrow, and also, depending on when you're watching this, on Tuesday, March the 15th at 4 p.m. Los Angeles time, we are doing our next meeting of Movie Club, and we're talking about the great Quentin Tarantino film, Django Unchained. We hope you guys will join us for that. All right, guys, that will do it for me for now. Thanks a lot for being here. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.